Evening. I've always been a list guy. It's the only way I can get things done. But in this busy world, the length of the list can somewhat be overwhelming. A list with 613 things would be one of those times. And during Jesus' time, the Jews had 613 commandments with the extracted from the Old Testament. If you did all those things, you were on your way to eternal life. But how many people were able to deal with that? I would guess not many. That's a lot of things on a list. I googled how many things that a human brain can focus on at a time, and the answer is four. So 613 laws, an attention span of four. The math just doesn't work. It makes your faith the burden because you're so busy thinking about the laws that you can't live in the moment. The scribes and the Pharisees were very invested in these laws. And when this young rabbi challenged their ways and started talking about a new kingdom, he causes quite a stir. More and more they peppered him with questions. They were plotting to catch him, refuting the law so that he could be dismissed. Last week it was, who do we pay the tax to? This week it was, what's the greatest of all the laws? But Jesus tells us, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. In today's gospel, Jesus speaks, all the wisdom can be put together in two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. Now we believe that Moses went up on the mountain to sit with God and he returned with two stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments. The first three give guidance on how to love God. Acknowledge him as the only God. You know, keep holy the Sabbath and don't use his name in vain. And the next seven give practical guidance on how to love our neighbors, honor our parents, be faithful to our spouses, and don't kill or steal, don't bear false witness or covet. Love is the hinge that pulls the two tablets together. Jesus reveals that love of God and love of neighbor fulfills the entire law and the teachings of all the prophets. It's much easier to get our arms around. In two short directives, he gives us the meaning of life, the road to fulfillment, and the secret to happiness. Not bad for one reading. The key word is obviously love. And that reminds me of my dad. You may have heard this story a few years back, but there's a lot of new people, and I love this story. Back in the day, he was a big man, 325, 350 pounds. When he died last year, people would come up at the wake and say, your dad was larger than life. And they were right, because many of them met him when they were in grade school, and he might have been the biggest human being they'd ever seen in their life. When we would fight as kids, he would walk, stand in the middle of the room, and call out, Love, love, love. And he would keep saying it till we stopped messing with each other and he could say, stop fighting. Jesus wants us to love each other. I wish it was so easy to go to the Middle East and call them forth to love. We thought he looked silly, but it worked. He signed every card he ever sent with big block letters that said, love. Simple concept, powerful results. All we need is love. The Greek language has eight different words for love. The three most popular are philia, which is friendship love, eros, which covers romantic love, and agape, which is selfless, sacrificial love. And when talking about the richness of God's plan, our focus is on agape. Consider the act of creation. It's completely selfless. God's the God of the universe. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need us, but he made us to share his love. And then even after we turned our back on him, he sent his son as a sacrifice to bring us back into right relationship. You know, Christ's ministry is an icon of what true love looks like in a sin-filled world. It's about self-giving with no sign of self-indulgence. Now, he could have said no, 
but he embraced the cross for us out of love. That's why in a Catholic church, you don't just see the cross. You see a crucifix, which highlights the greatest act of love ever recorded. The essence of life is to be loved and to love in return. We love because God first loved us. The passion of Christ embodies my favorite definition of love, giving yourself completely for the good of the other. Jesus Christ is our model of love. He's calling us to give ourselves completely for the good of the other. To all the married couples out there, at its best, this is what marriage allows us to experience. Our faith calls us to give ourselves to each other as Christ did for the church. What did he do for us? He died for us. Some would say that our number one goal when we're married is to get our spouse to heaven. And let me tell you a secret. When we give ourselves in love to help that to happen, we get to go to heaven as well. Simple concept. Powerful results. All we need is love. So how do we enhance our ability to love like Christ? I'll offer three thoughts. First, we desire it. It's important that we're all in. It's like learning to swim. It doesn't work if you don't jump in the pool. The Holy Spirit is a great instructor, but he can't make progress unless we're willing, willing to take the risk to dive in. Second, we ask for God's grace. We don't have to do it alone. We seek to see with God's eyes, which happens through our daily prayer routines. The catechism reminds us, we live as we pray. I found that when I sit in silence with God for 20 minutes at the start of each day, the day just seems to go better. We get spiritual nourishment by coming here to the Eucharist. It's a perfect time to ask for grace and for courage. And then if there's anything blocking God's grace within us, we seek God's mercy through the sacrament of reconciliation. It's like power washing our souls. And finally, armed with those superpowers, we get to work. Remember, if we truly love God, we'll love the things that he loves. And that's everyone. Let's start with those closest to us, our spouse, our family members, our co-workers, teachers, teammates, classmates. Then let's branch out from there to neighbors, to friends we know, to friends we may not have, we haven't met yet. And then the circle keeps getting larger and larger, including all races and creeds and ethnicities, even those who don't think like us and those we currently don't like very much. Remember what they say? We're called to love our enemies as well as our friends. Because God wants us all in the circle. We're all made in his image and his likeness. His love is big enough for the entire world. I like many things. The more we practice, the easier things get. Love is the same way. So start small, one holy moment at a time. Now maybe it's spending time with a lonely relative. Or maybe it's sending a thank you note to someone who's blessed your life. Or maybe it's taking a prayer blanket to someone who's sick. Or maybe it's a random act of kindness for a total stranger. And it grows from there. New habits work their way into our muscle memory. Did you know that our heart is a muscle? It's not a long list. It's not 613 laws. It's a short list. Love. Love. Simple concept, powerful results. All we need is love. Each week, I have the privilege of saying the last words at Mass. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Who needs your love today?